enjoyed last week Easter, Easter over at KBC. We had I think, almost 20 show up just from the Deaf Church, so it was really nice to see everyone. I think everybody that went really had fun and enjoyed the fellowshipping and, and the pastor's message over there. And seeing the kids. about Easter and what it means and think about trying to get more understanding this morning and hopefully encourage you guys to continue seeking the Lord and asking Him, explain to me more what it means, explain to me more, help my salvation become even more important in my life. Let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you so much again for the gift of your Son that came to earth and died on the cross in our place. Thank you, Father, for providing the forgiveness of sin so that we can have eternal life and a future home with you in heaven. We love you. We thank you. We pray this morning that you pour your Holy Spirit in this place. Give us more understanding of what happened on Easter Sunday. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now today we're also going to receive receiving communion. And so I want to remind, remind us again what we studied in February. We talked about the body and blood of Jesus and what it meant how the, the body of Jesus and the bread represented what? I mean, it represents Jesus' body, but what does that mean? Why was it broken? Anybody remember why? Why it was broken? Okay. We're going we're gonna to delve a little bit into that again. We're not going to talk about the same verses that we used two months ago in February. We focused a lot in Hebrews. But this morning we're actually going to focus on that last supper before Jesus was arrested and before he died on the cross. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that meant for them and their understanding, what they would have thought about that. And actually, we're not actually even going to begin there. We're actually going to start after Easter, after Jesus rose from the dead. And then we're going to go back and look at that and see what Jesus was saying, was telling the disciples at that Last Supper. We're going to start by reading Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Sunday, this is the same day the woman had gone to the tomb and found it empty and found the angel telling him that Jesus had risen from the dead. And now we have two of Jesus' followers that are traveling together on this road. And, it, and Luke tells us, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So about how far is that? Seven miles. How far do you think or how long do you think it would take you to walk seven miles? I looked up, they say most people can walk, you know, just regular walking, between like 15 to 20 miles a day. So this is like a half a day they're taking to walk together. So, you know, it's not just like a short walk to the corner market. They're, they're using like half the day to walk to this small town. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stopped. They stood still. And their faces were downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and don't know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. 
and the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the, they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said. But him, they did not see. So these two men didn't know, didn't recognize that Jesus was with them. They were kept from seeing that. Even though the woman and the disciples, they had already reported that Jesus was risen, there's still, what other faces did it say? They're sad, right? They're still sad. They thought, oh, this was the man that was going to save Israel, that was going to save us from Rome, is possibly what they were talking about. God's, God's goal is what? Is to save us from sin. Our goal is to save us from whatever's bothering or troubling us. And Jesus next, he's going to point out their, their doubt. That even though they've had the, the women's report, and even though Peter and them went to the went to the tomb and found it just like the woman had said, they still were doubting, they were still sad. And he said to them, How foolish you are, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? So that was Jesus' question to them. From their study, their understanding of the Word of God, the Scriptures in the Old Testament, what the prophets had written, did the Messiah have to suffer and die? What's your answer? Did Jesus have to suffer and die on the cross? Did he have to? You think, no, he didn't have to? Well, nobody forced him to. It was his choice, right? But did somebody have to suffer and die? There had for us, yes, yes, for us, right. And and Jesus himself, he's the only one qualified. Nobody else was pure without sin to suffer and die in our place. Only Jesus had the right qualifications. So for us to be saved, yes. And Jesus starts with Moses and all the prophets, and he starts explaining to them what was said in all the scriptures about himself. And as they approached the village where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. So these, these two, they're ready to go to this town, and Jesus looks like he's ready to go on more. But they strong, they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Okay. So these two men, they had probably been there Easter morning when the women came back, and Peter and went to the tomb and checked out everything and heard the other reports. And maybe they left like after lunch or something and they decided, you know, we can get there today. So they're arriving there at this town and it's, it's soon going to be evening. And so they invite Jesus. They, they said they urge him strongly. They convince him to stay there. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave things, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he disappeared, disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, you are not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, you know what? They've walked half the day. Now, they're going to walk back to Jerusalem, okay? They're excited, right? They want it. You know, they've already heard reports about Jesus. Now they've seen themselves. And they're not going to wait. They're not going to put it off till tomorrow. They're going now in the middle of the night back to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 disciples and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And it's when he breaks the bread that they recognize and have faith. And they acknowledge later, you know, even when he was talking with us and explaining the scriptures, our hearts 
or, or a, on fire or burning within us. And it says Jesus started his explanation where? Do you remember what the verse said? He started his explanation with Ad Adam and Eve? No, he started his explanation where? Did you catch it? With Moses. Why did he start explaining with Moses? Any idea? Back. Okay, the law, the Ten Commandments. Any other ideas? Why? Because, okay, think the Ten Commandments. Why was everyone in Jerusalem? Why did Jesus go and travel to Jerusalem before he was arrested and died on the cross? What was happening there? Right. Passover. Where is the first Passover? When does that happen? With Moses, right, in Egypt. So what, why is it important for us to understand Passover as it relates to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? So think about this while we're thinking about Passover. So we're going to read in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. Why are they in Egypt? Why are Moses and Aaron in Egypt? The people there, God's people, the Israelite people, what's happening to them there in Egypt? Are they free? Are they free? Are they slaves? I know you guys have been studying Galatians, and I think... Well, two, it would have been two weeks ago. Daryl was teaching, right, the part about that we were slaves to sin, right, before Jesus. Well, the Israelite people in Egypt were actual slaves under, under Pharaoh. And so God heard the people cry out, and he sent Moses. And do you remember what happened to all the different plagues that hit Egypt? And finally, the last one comes. What's the last plague that's going to happen that God's going to send? God said what? God said he's going to strike down the firstborn of Egypt. The firstborn of the people, the firstborn of the animals. Everything firstborn he was going to strike down and kill to convince Pharaoh to let his people leave Egypt. So that's what's happening now. And God gives Moses these instructions. He says, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are determined the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you can take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. So about 10 days they took care of them. When all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are being the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without meat. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Don't leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it up. This is how you are to eat it. With your coat tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in case it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. 
I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So what they ate was they had the meat roasted over the fire. They ate bitter herbs, which we find out is to remind them of the bitterness of slavery. How many of you have experienced the bitterness of sin in your life in the past, right? The problems and trials and things that can show up in your life, or how Satan can really defeat you because of sin. And also bread made without yeast. What's yeast for? When you make bread. Yeah, when you make bread, what does it do though? What's the yeast? It makes the bread rise, but you have to wait, right? You have to wait. You have to leave the dough and wait for it to rise. How long does it take to rise? Who bakes? Who bakes bread? Not me. <laughs> and I didn't look up to check. But they didn't have time. They didn't have time to wait. God was telling them, make it without yeast. Don't waste the time for it to arise. Eat it quickly. So go ahead and bake it without yeast. And then with the blood, they use it on the, the door frames as a sign. That blood what, was protection, right? That blood protected them against God's judgment when he struck Egypt. Now, if we look at Matthew, and we find out about the disciples, or here they, here's a picture of them looking for the bitter herbs and painting, or you know, putting the blood on the door frames. And if we read in Matthew, what happened when they, when they were in Jerusalem getting ready to celebrate Passover. Chapter 26, we're going to read verses 17 through 30. It says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, that's Passover. So on the first day of Passover, of the Passover celebration, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is, is near. I'm going to celebrate Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad. And they started to say to him, and one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. So they're all like, thinking about, does he mean me? Am I the one to betray him? And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of, the son of man will go just as it was written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. One thing we know about Easter is it is for everyone. The offer is for everyone. Isn't it awesome and amazing to hear Jesus is breaking bread with Judas, the one who that same night will betray him. Maybe you know somebody who feels like, well, I would like to know Jesus. I would like to have forgiveness of my sins, but maybe I 
I did too much wrong. Or maybe I, I messed up my life too much already. I knew the truth when I was growing up, when I was young, but now, now I'm older and I've already made too many mistakes. You know, the offer is still for all, all people. Jesus even gives Judas a piece of the bread. And John reports that Satan enters him when he receives, when he takes that bread from Jesus. I mean, remember what that bread represents. We're going to get into it a little more, but I'll just remind you what we, we talked about before. That's, that's representing Jesus' body. Hebrews tells us that's the veil in the temple that's been torn that gives us access to his presence. And when Judas takes that, Satan enters him, and he leaves right after that. But what God offers us at Easter is available for all, whether people choose to believe it or reject it. You know, even in, even in Exodus, when they were celebrating the Passover, when they were doing the Passover, a foreigner, it says foreigners can't eat it. But then it said if a foreigner wants to eat it, they have to be circumcised. If they're circumcised, they can eat it. And that circumcision was a sign that they belonged to God. Now, if we believe Jesus and we belong to him, you know, that's the point. When we, when we take communion, we're showing again, I belong to you. I believe you, Jesus. I believe in your blood for the forgiveness of my sin. So that offer is possible for everyone. Don't give up on the people you're praying for. Don't give up on the people that you think, oh, should I witness to them? Yes, you should witness to them. Continue witnessing to the people in your life. Continue witnessing to your family and to your friends. Keep inviting people to come to church. Even if they say no, you don't know when they might say yes. I'll come and join you. If they don't want to come to a service, invite them to an activity. Even just go out with them yourselves and chat with them. And ask God to direct your friendship, to give you the opportunity to plant that seed, to make that offer to them so they know you know what, Easter is for you too. But what does that offer involve? What does that mean? What do I need to tell my friend or my family? What do they need to know? I say, well, Easter is for you too. And we don't mean like the Easter bunny, but Easter is for them. What does that mean? What can I tell? What can I share with them? It's protection from God's judgment. And it's eternal life. The same as the blood that the Israelites put on their door frames, protected them when the firstborn of each were struck down. Having the blood of Jesus covering our sins protects us from punishment, from God's judgment. Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23 says, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The result of sin is death. It only leads to death. But Easter, we learn what? We know that God has provided a way for forgiveness of our sins, for protection from that punishment, that judgment that's coming. And also, it's the offer of having eternal life. Remember what we learned in Leviticus. Where is the life? Where is the life? The life is in the blood, right? They weren't, they weren't allowed. They were forbidden to eat blood the Israelites, right? The law said, no eating blood, because the life of the creature is in that blood. But what does Jesus do at the Last Supper? He says, this cup is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you. Remember we talked about in Hebrews that it's poured out at the altar in heaven. But now he says, drink it. They were forbidden to drink blood, to eat blood. But now Jesus says, this that represents my blood, drink it. Take my life into you. Right? Do 
Jesus saying, let my blood cleanse your hearts and your lives from sin, but let it also give you eternal life and real life. That when you drink that, when you accept my blood, you're going to be filled up with new life. You're going to be a new creation. We have the opportunity to have his life in us. that they be curious about Jesus or you yourself maybe need to, to know or be reminded. Maybe you've not yet made a decision if you believe Jesus or not. That's what the offer of Easter is. is the blood of Jesus for salvation, for forgiveness of sins and having eternal life. But not only that, it's also fellowship with Jesus. Having a real relationship with God through His Son, through His Spirit. And we should want that fellowship. We should want and be seeking to have more and more fellowship with Jesus every day through the Spirit. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 2, verse 2 says, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, but... We walk in the darkness. We lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we say, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here we find out, if we're fellowshipping with Jesus, He's going to cleanse us. He's going to make us more and more pure. You remember in Revelation, one of the letters was to the church at Laodicea, and God called them lukewarm. He said, I wish, I wish you were hot or cold. But because you're, you're lukewarm, I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth. And he said, counsel you, buy from me gold refined in the fire. How do we buy gold? How do we become pure like gold refined in fire? We take time with him. We fellowship with him. We let him purify us and cleanse us. And if we do sin, he is the one that goes before God for the Father on our behalf because His blood covers our sin. So we should want, I mean, how many of you appreciate that you have protection from God's judgment? Right? I don't want to suffer through revelation. How many of you are happy you have eternal life and a home in heaven? Amen. How many of you are happy that every day you can talk with Jesus? Okay? I encourage you, continue every day, talk with him more and more and more until you just have this ongoing conversation with him that never stops. Remember, Paul encouraged us, he says, pray without ceasing. How do you do that? You develop just a relationship with him where you're just always chatting and communicating. The communicating continues with him. You wake up in the morning and you think about him. It's like, it's like, it's like having a sweetheart. I wonder what my boyfriend's thinking. I wonder if he's away. I wonder if it's all right. 